All right, now we're going to continue with our slide set about foundation. In the previous lecture, we discussed the issue when you have your two cases. This is about the design for the soil below the footing itself. And our design here is going to be ASD. ASD means no load factors. So please remember, no load factors when it comes to can you guys see my screen? Yes. Or hey, do you see my screen? Yeah, I was talking about the previous part you were talking about. Previous what? The previous part. This about part here? Yes. This is what I'm talking about here. I know, but I was talking about the previous thing you were talking about. You mean the top reinforcing? Yeah. OK. Um, I thought that you are done with it since no one asked questions and I, I thought that we're good. All right, so you'd like to stop for a minute and back go back to it, right? This is what you're saying. No, I was just wondering if you were showing something because it was just the slides, but I, I understand the, what we have to do for that part. Great, okay, very good, all right. So uh, any other questions from anyone else on the compression steel? And the fact that if you are receiving here um, some weird numbers like negative value for the AS2, it means that the assumption that the top steel is dealing is incorrect. Any other questions on this issue? Okay, good. All right, now let's continue here. So what happened? When we design here the footing size, this is going to be actual design of the soil. We don't really design the concrete itself as a material. What we do here, we design the soil below the footing. And in this case, we're going to be doing an ASD design. ASD means a level of stress design. When you do a level of stress design, there's no load factors. The load factors going to be one and life load factors going to be equal to one. There is no 1 1.2, 1 1.6, and the 1.4, we don't have it in this case. So we have here two loads. We have vertical axial load, and then we have rotational load, which is a moment. So this moment is applied in the same time with this axial load. So both of these two, they happen at the same time. So when I see here two cases, does it mean that each one of them is gonna be happening separately, but I'm just splitting them so that I can study each source separately. And then at the end, I combine the stresses. So due to axial load, vertical axial load, I'm gonna have uniform stress below the footing. I'm gonna call it just F sub P for now. And F sub P means the stress below the footing due to the axial load P or vertical load P. FM is gonna be the stress below the footing, which means on the soil due to the moment. So on one side, here's gonna be compression, the other side needs to be tension, but we understand that soil cannot take tension. So what's gonna happen at the end of the day, we need to add the stresses. So I'm gonna say here, this is gonna be 0.1 and this is gonna be 0.2. Like what you see here, this is gonna be 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and the right point is gonna be 0 0.2, 0 0.2. So what you need to do is to take this as the compressive stresses on the soil and the side at 0.1, add it to the tensile stresses due to moment, and the same thing for 0.2. And with that, you can end up with two cases. If numeric value of F sub P is more than this numeric value of F sub M, you're gonna end up with some compressive stresses at this end. But usually at the compression side, this compressive stress is gonna be at this compressive stress and there's not gonna be any tension on the soil. So I have here two cases again. Here's the first case. First case when you have compression on both sides. Second case when F sub M is gonna be greater in value than F sub P. And in this case, the footing is gonna be lifting up from one side. Since the soil cannot take any tensile stress, so in this case, the stress is gonna get redistributed and we can use this equation that we discussed last time. So actually, when you have a moment on a footing with no axial load, you're gonna be in trouble because 
the footing is going to be unable to resist it. I mean, you need to have some weight to balance the footing from rotation. Now let's go here through these two examples to see how this can be done. In this figure here, this figure four, we have this footing. Here's a plan of it, and here's like an elevation. It's supporting a moment frame column. When you see here moment frame column, it means you expect some moment on the footing. The service vertical load. Service means dead plus life. There is no load factors. It is not ultimate. It's going to be ASD design now. So please remember this because this can be like a killer if you use load factors in your exam or midterm. This is going to be like, you're going to be losing lots of points. I don't want you to do this. So the service load here is 600 caps, dead load plus life load as an axle load. This is going to be P. And the moment, service moment, is going to be 720 kip foot. Here's a moment. Now, neutral axis in this case, or the axis of rotation, is going to be this vertical line on the plane, because moment is causing your compression and causing your tension. The contact area between the footing and the soil is going to be equal to 12 times 8, 120 square feet. It's going to be this plane view. Moment of inertia is going to be this moment of inertia about this axis. So the width B is going to be 10 feet. And in the equation, if you have H, this going to be H, which is the same as L. It's going to be 12. The question here, what is the maximum soil pressure? And then you have a few options. This is going to be problem number two, or example two. In example three, they say the vertical load reduced to 240 caps, and the moment stays the same. What does it mean by that? It means for the same given moment, this axle or vertical load dropped down to 240. And you want you to study the effect of reducing the axle load. A minute ago, I was saying that this axle load is actually balancing the footing. If you have just moment of rotation, this is going to be big trouble because the footing is going to be lifting up, it's going to be just rotating. So you need some axle load to bring it down or to stabilize it. So in this case, they say vertical load reduced to 140 caps. Now the question is, how about the moment? I'm going to say no discussion. The moment, it means moment stayed the same as 720 caps. So let's go here first to this example too and figure out what is the maximum soil pressure below the footing. The vertical load is 600 caps, which is SP. The moment is 720, given the problem. I'm going to have your distribution of the stress. It's going to be uniform due to axial load. It's going to be triangular distribution due to this moment. Contact area is going to be 120 square feet. This is the contact area between the footing and between the soil. The section modulus, which is moment of inertia divided by Y or divided by C, is going to be equal to B L squared divided by 6. Now, which one is B? Which one is L? I'm going to go back here, a slide, and just look at it. Now, if you try here to find out the section models about this axis, this gives you your B and this gives you your L. Because the moment is applied about this axis here. So it's going to be B, L squared, divided by 6. 10 times 12 squared, divided by 6. 10 times 12 squared, divided by 6. It's going to be 240 cubic feet. Now, let's see here the stress due to just the axial load. I'm splitting here the two sources or the two forces, the two actions. F sub P is going to be equal to P divided by the contact area. It's going to be 600 caps divided by the 120. I'm going to have 5 cap per square foot due to this vertical load. Due to moment, F sub M is going to be equal to the moment divided by the section modulus, M divided by S. This is going to be very similar to the uncracked section, if you recall. This equations we used them before in the past. So it's gonna be M over S, it's gonna be 720, the moment, kip foot, and let's be careful here about units. Yeah, this kip foot, and this is gonna be in feet cubic. 720 divided by 240 is gonna be 3 KSF. Now, previously I said let's compare here between the value, numerical value of F sub P versus F sub M. I'd like this F sub P to be more than F sub M, which is happening in my example, which is great. If I may put some numbers here, I'm going to say at this point here, the stress is equal to 5 KSF. 
Same thing at this point here and the left point is gonna be five KSF. How about due to moment? You can say at the left point is gonna be three KSF. And the right point is gonna be also three KSF. Okay, let me try to find out here the final stresses. So I'm going to say I have here compression of five, tension of three, can I end up with on this side? This is going to be two KSF as compression. You see here, I didn't say positive and negative. I just say it's going to be tension, compression. The difference is going to be I have more compression, so I can deal with it this way. How about the right side? Can I have, I have five as compression and three compression. I'm gonna add them up to each other. I'm gonna have end up with eight KSI. So now what is the maximum stress below the foot end? And you say it's gonna be this eight KSI. And the good thing, I don't have any tension. And you're gonna see it right here, eight and two, eight and two. All right. Question came here. Why did we pick this axis? Reasons because the moment given here in the picture to be acting this way. This is the reason I picked this axis because of the direction of the moment. This moment says it's gonna be pushing this side of the footing down and pulling this up. If someone told me here that the foot is gonna be pushed down on this side and pulled up from that side, I'm gonna say now in this case, my axis is gonna be about here, but it didn't happen. According to this picture, compression is given this side and tension is given on that side. According to this picture here. This is why I use this axis, the vertical axis. So, okay, now I understand this distribution. I find out the stress at both points, both ends. Now I'm gonna go back here. Now I understand that this gonna be here 8 KSF and 2 KSF. So 8 KSF is giving the compression side and 2 KSF is giving the tensile side. I'm gonna ask here some questions. What is your understanding for the stress at this point? Can someone help me here? Final total stress. How much is it right here at this point? Eight. Eight? Okay. How about this point? Eight. Very good. How about here? Two. Two, okay, so, two. right? And here, you can see two, two. KSF. Two. How about here right in the middle? Can someone guess this? Let's see, right in the middle of the footing. Roughly, how five. much is going to be? Five KSF. How did you come up with this fine? That is the balance point. Yeah, it's like an average. If you like, you can say eight plus two because this is just linear relationship, right? Linear distribution. You can say five KSF. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Throughout the entire width of the footing, which is right here in the middle. Look, I was just asking about this value here. But this value from here to there, right? So you say, well, someone can also say eight minus two is gonna be equal to how much? Six divided by the length. With that, you figure out the slope. And then you take this value plus the slope multiplied by the distance. You're gonna end up with exactly the same thing. This is gonna be fine. Very good. So with that, I'm done with this example two. Now I need to go to example three and see what's going on. In example three, if I may go back one slide, it says the vertical load now dropped to 240 kips. What does it mean? Would the contact area change? Length and B, L and B? No. Would the moment change? No. Just P is going to change. Meaning here's a new axial force and here's the same moment. Area is the same. S is going to be the same. F due to P is going to drop down. Why? Because instead of 600, now I use 240 kips. This is going to be 2 KSF. And the stress due to this moment is going to be the same, 3 KSF. It didn't change. Now, here's the trouble I'm in. 
The amount of excess load to balance the footing, which means the stress here at one side, is going to be lower than the value for the flexure stress. Now I cannot use the standard equation, the regular equation. Instead, I'm going to have this triangular distribution, and they can use this equation, equation five in this case, five and six. So I need to figure out the eccentricity, which is this E. It's going to be equal to M divided by P. So this E here is M divided by P is going to be equal to three feet. I can find out also X, this distance, total length of the footing is 12. L over two is going to be equal to six feet. So 12 divided by two minus three is going to be equal to three feet. Now I can find out the stress based on this equation is going to be 5.33 KSI. All right, with now I'm done. Here's the stress at this point. And the distance X is going to be equal to three feet. Therefore this distance, total distance over which the stress is applied is going to be nine feet. Y three times X. Any questions? Yeah, for uh, example two, uh, yeah. for the S, when it's BL squared divided by six, you yeah. got the six from 12 divided by two, yes? Yes, this is correct, two. but which 12? <laughs> because we have here a few 12s, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, the, uh, the equation. The yeah. The equation equals two. Usually we say BH cubed. This is what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Divide by 12. Right. And the S equals I divided by C, correct? Uh -huh. Okay. And C equals H divided by 2. Therefore, S equals, now you have BH cubed is going to be BH squared because you divide here by C. And because you have this 2 and you have 12, now it becomes 6. It's going to be BH squared divided by 6. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Are we good about this example three? Any questions? All right, we'll continue and see what happened when you have this combined footing. So this here, we call it a single footing, if you like, split footing, single footing, just a footing, a pad. Sometimes you call it a pad. But when you have two columns coming to the same footing, we call it combined footing. Can I show you an example of this? Here it is, plan view, you have two columns. It goes to the same footing. So we call this combined footing. So this usually happens when the two columns are closer to each other. So you try here, let's say that at the beginning, you try to find out the size of the footing that's gonna come as a square footing. And then the size of the footing comes to be like, let's say this way, just from some dimension or some boxes. It doesn't mean it's gonna be exact to scale, right? And then do the other footing from the other side and then here's what I'm getting. The footing is going to be like this, the overlap. So I'm going to say, just to make it easy for construction, let's just make it as one footing to combine both of these two footings. So this is the reason we call it here combined footings. Again, the reason when the two columns are getting close to each other. So in this case, we have two columns. We have C2 and C4. And you see this column here looks smaller than this column. This is why also the loads in column C4 is larger than that of C2. Look at the dead load and life load. 850 is 680, right? So C2 carries less load, 400, 320. It says here the spacing between the two columns is eight feet, meaning from here to here, this distance is eight feet. The allowable soil bearing pressure is 8,000 PSA, meaning 8 KSA. So I'm gonna say here Q11, I can write it here. Q11 equals 8 KSA. Why would I put it in kip per square foot? Because the loads here also is getting kept. Now, when you have here two vertical loads, then you have one coming to each footing. You need to think about the result because at the end, this footing is going to see one load, one big load, which is the summation of these two loads. 
So I'm gonna call, where is this result implicated at? Do you think it's gonna be more towards C2 or more towards C4? Someone help? C4. Why is that? Because? Greater loading. Yeah, it's bigger loading. So result is gonna be in this side, right? It's gonna be towards this side. And if I'm trying to eliminate here now, when it comes to just one big footing here, if I'm trying to eliminate the amount of rotational, which means the amount of moment come to it, I will try to put this right to be in the dead center of the footing, which means right in the center of this footing. Look, look at this. If this gave me the footing, then where is the centroid of this footing? It's gonna be in the intersection of these two diagonals, right? And the best location for this resultant force is gonna be right here. If you do this, if you put the result on right at the center of this footing, you're going to be eliminating most of the moment. So now you're going to have very limited amount of moment. Look here at this footing. You have moment and axial load, right? This equivalent to an axial load, which is shifted from the center. Example is going to show this clearly. You know, say the first question is ask for the footing dimensions. What footing dimension would you pick? And the second one, what is the distance from the column C4 to the left end of the footing? We call this the left cantilever, meaning how much is this distance from here to there? I understand this is going to be eight feet. Question is how much is this? And of course, if you can answer this and you know the total length of the footing, you can also figure out the right cantilever length, which means this distance here. You can figure this out. If you have the total length, subtract eight feet, subtract the lift, can't leave. Okay, here's what I was talking about. This P total, which is a resultant, you want it to be right in the center of the footing. And how would you do this? Because this column location is fixed. So your only chance to do this, if you think about this footing, here it is, and then you start to play with the location, you bring it right or you bring it left because this column location is fixed. Would you put it right here in the middle like this? You can say no. I'm trying to put the center of this footing to be right in the middle at the resultant force. Here's the resultant force. I want it to be right in the middle of the footing. Now let me figure out first the location, the value of this resultant force. I have the column loads from the table given, this table. So I'm gonna take it, carry them over here. Total force, don't forget. We don't here do ultimate loads because we're just designing the soil. We're not designing the footing itself and the reinforcing inside it. We're just designing the size of the footing, which means our designers can be on the soil itself. I have total of 1250, total of 1000 for each column. Total load, if you add this number to that number, it's gonna be 2250, which is this P total. Allowable is 8K, sir. So at the end, you can treat this as if you have one big footing and then you are going to have one big load, which is this P total. If this is going to be right in the center, this resultant is going to be right in the center of the footing, it means no moment at all. So I'm going to say, let me take this value here divided by that level and figure out how much footing I need in terms of the contact area length by width. It says here 281 square feet. I said, okay. How about 12 by 24? Why did I pick this value here or this footing? Because I have few options. So try this 12 by 24, 12 by 12, 6 by 24, 20 by 20. If you're talking about square footing, does it make sense? When you have two columns like this, does it make sense you're going to have a square footing? You just give you a rectangular footing. Let's, fi let's figure out what is this contact area for 12 by 24. 12 by 24, meaning 288 square feet. You're asking for minimum of 281 to keep the stresses within 8 KSF or lower. My chance is good to go to 12 by 24. This seems to be a good option. 12 by 12 is not good. It's going to give you here less contact area, right? So I'm going to go back here. 12 by 12 is not good. 6 by 24 is not good because 12 by 24 is making it. It's barely making it. You have here 288 versus 281. So 6 by 24 is not a good option. 
20 by 20 is going to be 400 square feet of contact area. This 20 by 20 is going to be too much. You just need 281. So I'm going to go here with 12 by 24. I'm going to say now contact area is going to be 288, the section modulus, if I have any moment, because the location of this resultant relative to the center of the footing, I'm going to say about this axis, because if I have any potential moments, it's going to be happening about this axis. This is going to be S, it's going to be BT squared divided by 6, it's going to be 12 by 24 divided by 6, it's going to be this number here, 1152 cubic feet. Is it good? Now let me check the stresses and let me decide on where exactly this location of the resultant, because I don't know exactly where it's gonna happen. Now in this analysis, I put this to be eight and a half, this to be seven and a half, because now I have the solution. But at the beginning, you don't know exactly how to place this footing. If you remember at the beginning, I was saying, should I bring it by right or left? I don't know yet. So I need to find out this X distance. You see this X distance from the resultant to the left column. Total distance from the left column to the right column, center to center is gonna be eight feet. This column here is 1250 kips, this column is a thousand kips. Where is these two numbers come from? Let's say from this slide here, from these two values. Now to do this, you need to take the moment about this column here, about this point. So take the moment about this point. For the two forces, what two forces? I'm gonna say for the 1250 and the thousand. So you take 1250 times zero plus a thousand times eight, it's gonna be equal to 2250, 2250 multiplied by X. We did that. So here's a thousand times eight divided by 2250. It's gonna get you this to be 3.55 feet. In construction, 0 0.05 feet does make any sense. Maybe three and a half feet would make sense. That's why I ended up with three and a half feet. If the total length, 24, one half of this gave me 12 feet. This distance here is gave me three and a half feet and the other distance is how much? How much is this? Can someone help? Yes. Four and a half. Four and a half feet. So in this case, this gave me three and a half and this gave me 12, this gave me eight and a half. And how about this distance? You can say 12 minus four and a half is seven and a half, which is right here. You can say this is gonna be here seven and a half feet. So as you see here, I moved the footing a little bit to the left. I made this to be eight and a half, this gave me seven and a half because I wanted this centroid of the footing or the center of the footing to be aligned with the resultant force. And by doing this, I eliminating the moment applied on the footing. But you know what? Because of my choice here, if I put it exactly at 3.55, the eccentricity is going to be equal to zero. But I put a three and a half and the slight difference of 0 0.05 feet. This 0 0.05 feet is going to be the eccentricity. And to be exact, here's the eccentricity. Instead of just being 0 0.05, now it becomes 0 0.055. You see this number here? Just because we're just going here in details, right? So we can say maybe about 0 0.06 feet if you want to. And this is going to be the amount of eccentricity that this foot is going to be exposed to. Now this footing at the end of the day is going to be exposed to an axial force of 2250 plus a moment of this load multiplied by E, which is this eccentricity. It's gonna be a very small model. But you can also do detailed analysis and figure out the exact stress distribution below the footing if you want to, if this is like very critical footing. So I'm gonna say here's a moment, 2250 multiplied by the eccentricity. When you do here M over S is only 0.1 KSF. You're gonna say which moment? I'm gonna say this moment, which S? You see this S that we did for this footing here. When you do here F1 and F2, no side of this foot is gonna be uplifting, uplifting. And one side is gonna be 7.9 KSF, the other side is gonna be 7.7 KSF, 
which is in that level, which is good. Any questions besides finding out the X value? This X one, any questions? All right, so let me tell you how I did this analysis to figure out the resultant location. In the statics, the way that we find out the resultant, by taking the moment of all the forces to be the same as the moment of the resultant. So let me put it down here. Say moment, all forces equals moment of resultant. It's okay. How much is the moment for all the forces? All the forces means only two forces. This is like components. And this gave me the resultant, right? So I'm going to say moment for all the forces. If you take the moment about this point, it's going to be 1250 times zero plus 1,000 times eight feet. It's going to be the moment of all the forces, the components, equals the resultant force multiplied by x1. What is x1 now? It's going to be this r. Now let's look here for x1. So we're going to say x1 equals. It's going to be equal to 1,000 times 8. divided by 2250. And this equals 3.55 feet. Any questions? No questions. All right, very good. So what we're doing here, actually we're doing soil design, as I said, we're doing here soil check. We wanna be sure that the contact um, area between the footing and the soil is enough so that the pressure is not going beyond certain limit. And the limit here was, let's say, 8 KSF, right? It depends on the allowable soil value given to you. But at certain point, we need to look at the design for the concrete itself and for the reinforcing, because this is here about concrete design. So, but we cannot do this before we understand what does it mean by the footing size and why do we pick this size here, right? We have one more example on a combined footing. And I'm gonna skip this example here, five to seven, but I'm gonna go through it quickly. And it's gonna be a task for you that you read it, understand it, come back next time with questions. In our case here, we have two columns and the difference between the load is just big. Look at this, 12 caps and two caps. The concrete unit weight of the footing is also given, which means you need to figure out the weight of this footing. It's going to come the picture. And here, this weight of the footing was kind of included in the column loads. So you don't really need to account for it. But in this case here, do you want you to figure out the weight of the footing and add it to the picture, which means now, if you look here at this dimensions, this is here 10 feet, you have here four feet, right? And the footing center of the footing is gonna be right here, correct? Because this column is gonna be two feet by two feet. The distance from the center of this column to the face of the column is gonna be a foot, meaning 
from here to here is how much? I'm gonna write it down here. I'm gonna put it to be five feet. Center of the footing. The weight of the footing is gonna be also, it's gonna be right here at the center of the footing. So now I have three forces, but one of them, the good thing about it is gonna be right in the center of the footing. So you just take the weight of the footing divided by the contact area to give you the pressure due to the self weight. This A also is the footing width is four feet. Now I'm gonna say, where's the width? I'm gonna say width is gonna be perpendicular to the screen. So this is gonna be here four feet. Okay, some questions, five and six and seven and the pressure and what do I need to do and things like this. I want you to read this carefully. So what you need to do is to find out about the centroid of the footing. Now, as you see here, I cannot change the location of the footing. This is completely different from this design. In this case here, I was able to play with the size of the footing and the location relative location from the left column and right column. Like what I was talking about here. I I have the chance here to bring it right to left. I mean, it's, it was just up to me to eliminate any moment. But in this case here, the difference is it is already set. This can't lever is gonna be four feet, this can't lever is gonna be three feet. You cannot change this fact. So you're gonna have a moment anyways, whether you want it or you don't want it. And you cannot eliminate this moment. It's gonna be just one thing that you need to live with. So here's what we said. Let's look here at the center of the footing, find out all the vertical loads and find out all the moments. And this is exactly what's happening here. So I want you to go here through this and study it yourself, understand it. And next time we're gonna come up with questions and I should be able to answer it for you. Are we good? Do you guys need more help on this problem or you understand what's going on? You have an idea what's going on. I, I don't mean that you read it already, right? I'm just trying to open here the topic or the subject for you, this example for you. What is the, because I know we have the 10 feet. What's the the other dimension to figure this out? This one? You mean this one? You mean this one? Oh, okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah, this gave you the width of the footing. Four feet perpendicular to the board. What else? Very good question, Angel. Yeah. What else? What other questions you may have about this problem? Can I change this four feet and make it 10 feet? Or make it three feet? Can I move this box right or left? Do I have the chance to do this in this problem here? No. No, no I don't. Yeah. This is already set. So your goal here is to find out the total vertical load and the total moment on the footing, and then do the stress analysis. Exactly what you're gonna see here. All right. Now we need to look at the reinforcing. We need to see what's going on. How can I do the reinforcing for a footing like this? This is what's critical to me. This is what the reinforced concrete design is about. So first we have the soil design to size the footing, come up with the length and width. Second here in this example, I have this gravity footing, eight feet and a half by eight feet and a half, eight six by eight six, and here's the thickness. It's giving the total thickness of the footing. Just you know, the concrete cover in footings is gonna be more than what you have for beams and slabs. For footings, it's gonna be at least three inch, clear. So in foundation, because you have the soil effect, you'd like to make the cover to be three inches. The column that's supporting is 24 by 24. The concrete strength at 20 days at 3000 PSI, this gave you F prime C. The column ultimate load, what does it mean by ultimate? Is this factor or unfactor? Is this P load load plus P life load or this is just the total? P did load plus life load. Or what is this? This gave you P ultimate, right? Meaning this gave you 1.2 dead plus 1.6 life. Already factors, you don't need to add any factors. It is already a factor to you. And the question is gonna be about the reinforcing needed in the foot.
So here's the footing. I need to figure out the depth. I understand that the thickness is 30 inches. You have three inch cover. And then you have reinforcing in both directions. If you remember here, reinforcing is gonna be running in this direction and running in this direction. And most likely, if you look here at the rebar size, it's like number seven, number six, I'm gonna say like an inch diameter. So I can here deduct one inch for the rebar size. I'm gonna end up with 26 inches. So this gave you the effect of depth. So if you like, this gave you the footing and this gave you the rebar. And the depth in this case is gave you from here to there. This gave you the depth. Tension, and this gave you compression. And this piece here wants to lift up, same as this piece. And the critical section for a moment is gonna be right at the face of the column. Let me go back here now, this slide 42, let me go back here to this slide, so that it makes a little bit more sense. I'm gonna remind you with this. I'm gonna go back here to slide 10. When you put pressure from the underside of the footing, this footing wants to lift up. And this gives you the tension side. And you see the depth is giving from the top compression to the center of the rebars. And critical section for a moment is giving both sides of the footing. You're gonna have one here, and then you're gonna have one here. They're both the same. But now when you look at the footing in plan, you're gonna go now to 42. You're gonna see here that you have two critical sections because this side wants to lift up, this side also wants to lift up. But in the same time, this side wants to lift up and the same thing for this side. So you have here two axes in both perpendicular directions. So I said, well, let me take this and whatever is going to happen in this section, along this section, is going to apply to all four sections. Why? Because dimension is the same, eight and a half, eight and a half, the column size is the same. So this section is going to be the same as this section, same as this section, same as this section. You say, okay. Q below the footing, which is means the stress below the footing, is going to be equal to P sub U. But, I remember in the past, I said this is gonna be like service load, didn't I? When we size the footing, it's gonna be like service load. Am I correct? Yes. We say yes. when we size the footing, we're gonna be using service load, it's gonna be ASD design. But in this case, I'm not trying here to size the footing. Footing is already sized. I'm trying to solve for the reinforcing and do all the checks needed. So now it's gonna be concrete design. So the stress I need to use here is going to be at the ultimate level, which means going to be factored load. The factor is going to be already there. So this is stress here. It is not to compare with the allowable stress for the soil to design the footing dimensions length by width. But this is stress here is to figure out the moment along this critical section. So, okay. The stress below the entire footing is gonna be equal to the total vertical load divided by the contact area of the footing, eight and a half by eight and a half. Now it's gonna be 9.41. Along this section, the force is gonna be concentrated right in the middle of that section. Let me just stop here. So if I may do the diagonals, Right? You're gonna have one big load coming from the underside of the footing, pushing up, and is gonna be located right here at this center. And this force here is gonna be equal to this shaded area multiplied by 941, the stress. Okay, how much is this X to figure out this area? Yes, say I have eight and a half feet minus two, it's gonna be six and a half divided by two, it's gonna be three and a quarter. It's exactly what you have here. Here's X, three and a quarter feet times eight and a half times nine four one. It's gonna give you this big force that's pushing up. So if you look here at this equation, if you take here Q ultimate, apply by B, apply by X, if you just take this section of it, of the equation, right? Only up to here, right? It's gonna give you the force. So I can come here and say, okay, the force equals 
is the force. Ultimate equals force pushing up. Give equal to Q ultimate multiplied by eight and a half multiplied by X, which is three and quarter feet. Take this force here, multiply by the moment arm. In this moment arm, since this is going to be the center of this section of the footing, is going to be x over 2. If this is x, it's going to be x over 2. So it's going to multiply by x squared over 2. Now, this explains why do I have here x squared over 2. It's going to be the moment. 9 for 1, ultimate stress, 8 and a half. This width times x, 3 and quarter squared, divided by 2. Here is the moment at the face of the column, 422.4 kip foot along the entire width of eight and a half feet, which means whatever reinforcing and the width resisting this moment is going to be equal to eight and a half feet. Does make sense? Yes, no? Yes, it makes sense. Okay. Can you explain that last part again? You said the length uh, supporting the whole moment is eight and a half feet. All right, no problem. I'm trying to work here on this section of the footing, right? I have this uniform stress. So I'm going to say this uniform stress is equal to Q ultimate. And my goal here is to find out this force is going to be lifting it up, which I called here F sub U. It's going to be equal to this distance X multiplied by the width, perpendicular to the screen, right? Width of the footing, eight and a half. And it's going to be three and quarter times Q ultimate is going to get you this force. Multiply by one half of X, get you the moment. This moment here is pushing the entire footing up. So if I may go back here, I'm going to say, where's my section? I'm going to say, your section is going to be right here at the face of this column. Look at this. Right? Let's give you the critical section. And this force is pushing down here. It's going to be pushing this section up. And the section resisting the moment in this case actually is going to be this section here, if this makes sense to you guys. Correct? It's going to be my concrete section that I'm working on. This is causing this piece here to go up. So the top here is a section. The width is going to be the same as the width of the concrete footing. So your B, when it comes to analysis, is going to be equal to eight and a half feet. Correct? And the depth is going to be 30 inches, subtracting a few inches, going to be 26 inches. And the reinforcing is going to be this reinforcing running this way, perpendicular to this section. This makes sense now? Yes, thank you. So here's the moment, 422.4. Now I need to find out how much moment, how much AS is needed. How much reinforcing are we talking about? So I'm looking here at this equation. I'm going to say, this is the equation I'm used to, correct? You guys used to this equation. You have seen it before. AS, FY, D minus over 2. And usually we assume steel is yielding. So you put this to be 60. And my apology here, we have a missing fee. You see this here in the equation? This is going to be fee. So I need to fix this. Okay, if you set V men to be the same as M sub U, you are trying to utilize here the steel to the maximum. So you're going to be setting this V men to be the same as M sub U. And this is exactly what I have done here in this equation. So AS is going to be equal to M sub U divided by FY divided by D minus over 2 divided by V. This is exactly what we have here in this equation. So what we have done here, we put you can see here, set phi mn to be the same as m sub u. So 
what I have done here. Now, I don't have this A over 2. Correct? So I don't have D minus A over 2. But I can have a reasonable assumption for it, which is 90% of the depth. So I'm going to say D minus A over 2 is assumed to be 0.9 D. So this is going to be the same as this term here. This gave you a reasonable assumption at the beginning, just to figure out the amount of reporting. So if you do this in this equation, M sub U is going to be a numerical value that you have, and don't forget to multiply by 12 because the everything here is going to be in inches. And the fee factor is say, I'm going to be doing a good job here, and then I'm going to be dumping a lot of reinforcing. So I'm estimating fee to be 0.9. F sub Y is going to be 60 K sign. 0.9 times the depth, 26 inches. And with that, I need four square inches. That's all what you need, four square inches of reinforcing. This is going to be throughout the entire footing. So I said, let me put here the number seven. How did I come up with this the number seven? I'm going to take you back to here. I have a few options, 10, seven, 10, six, 14, seven, 14, six. So I'm going to pick the first one, just to start here with the first one and see if it's going to work or not. Here's AS. The tension provided because we assume he read the strength is going to be happening. So it's going to be six square inches times 60. Now find out the A value, like compression block depth. We went through this already. This is going to be a very simple rectangular section. And we looked here at Feynman, and Feynman turned to be 683 foot, more than M sub U. We said, okay, good. This is going to be a good design for the footing. Here's what happened. In order for me to come up with an estimate of the reinforcing needed, I assume that M sub U is going to be the same as Feynman, which is true. You wanted Feynman to be at least equal to M sub U. And for D minus A over 2, I assumed it to be 90% of D. Someone could have done it and say maybe 95%. You can say fine, you can do it 95%. If you do 95%, you end up with less reinforcing. Someone's going to say maybe 85%. You can say fine. It should be somewhere from 85% to 90% of the depth, D. Any assumptions get you okay because after you put this assumption here, you try a certain amount of reinforcing and then you confirm that female is going to be more than M sub U. So if your assumption is wrong, right? If this is too little and you start to use lower enforcing than this value, end up with Feynman to be lower than M sub U. So I guess it doesn't work this way. Let me add more enforcing. So I would say start with 90% depth is gonna be like good assumption, unless the problem says here, here's the amount of enforcing given to you and you don't really have to try this. But I'm telling you what happened here in reality. In actual practice, this is what we do. We start with some D minus over two value. We say 90% is good enough. Let me start with this. If it doesn't work fine, I can change it. I can just play with the amount of reinforcing. Let me put something there reason. Any questions? Questions? All right. Let me continue. Now, how would you check the shear? Because if you remember in beam design, we have the moment and then we have the shear. So for today, I'm going to be finishing this shear check, and that's it. Shear check, which means right here. If you want to check the shear, and look what happened here at failure, you're going to see that we usually go at the distance away from the face of the column, like what happened in shear for beams. This is shear here in beams. We say that we're going to be going here D distance away from face of support to go to the critical section. Same thing here. Here is the face of the column. Going to be going D distance away from the face of the column and find out the shear force. Q is 941 from the previous step, 941. 
This distance here, x, you can figure it out. This gonna be three and quarter, subtracting the depth, but you need to put it here in feet. This gonna be like a foot. Let's say 1.08. Take this x, multiply by eight and a half, multiply by q ultimate. So exactly what's happening here. And this is gonna be your shear demand. Now, in this case, I don't have here any reinforcing for the shear because we don't put reinforcing on tires. Reinforcing as on tires in the footing. So what's gonna happen, I'm gonna be just using the concrete strength to resist the shear. We call this one way shear. So, okay. Here's the strength of the concrete. Very similar to what we have in concrete beams. If you're recalling concrete beams, we have two components, the concrete and the steel. In our case here, steel is not doing anything because we don't have any ties in foundation. So it's gonna be just VVC. Here is VC, two square to V prime C, the width times the depth. Okay. Two square to V prime C times the area of the concrete, width times the depth. Okay, where's the width of the concrete? Width is gonna be eight and a half times 12 because you need to have 10 inches. Depth of the concrete is gonna be 26 inches. This gonna be the depth. So both of these two items gonna be the area of the concrete. Fee factor is 7.5. Same for all shear design. And then two squares of F prime C, we have them right here, right? Two squares of F prime C, we have them right here. And with that, I have a trend of 217.88 caps. How much was the demand? I'm gonna go back here one step. Look at the demand, it's gonna be 86. So this is good. The thickness provided here for this footing is good enough, good sufficient. Any questions? Yes? Like to your questions? Okay, with this, I'm done for today with this lecture.